16 chapters of the book of Joshua to chapter 22. It is a long chapter, and we'll miss out a few verses, but only a few. Uh, It's not a chapter which you can break down into different parts. It is one story. It's the last uh, incidence of the problem of the two and a half tribes who did not cross the Jordan, but settled their inheritance in the eastern province. Uh, Joshua chapter 22, reading from verse 1. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and he said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice in all that I have commanded you. You have not forsaken your brethren these many days down to this day. Now, can I point out to you that covers a period of seven years. You have not mistaken them down to this day, but have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brethren as he promised them. Therefore turn and go to your home in the land where your possession lies, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Take good care to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments, and to cleave to him, and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went to their homes. Verse 10. And they came to the region about the Jordan that lies in the land of Canaan. The Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of great size. And the people of Israel heard say, Behold, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an an altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of this, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. Then the people of Israel sent to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them the head of a family among the clans of Israel. And they came to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead and said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord, What is this treachery which you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord? Have we not had enough of the sin of Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves, and for which there came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord, that you must turn away this day from following the Lord. And if you rebel against the Lord today, he will be angry with the whole congregation of Israel tomorrow. But now if your land is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land, where the Lord's tabernacle stands, and take for yourselves a possession amongst us only. Do not rebel against the Lord or make us rebels by building yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things and wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel? And he did not perish alone for his iniquity. Then the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, The mighty one God the Lord, the mighty one God the Lord, He knows and let Israel itself know. If it was in rebellion or in breach of faith towards the Lord, spare us not today for building an altar to turn away from following the Lord. Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or cereal offerings or peace offerings on it, may the Lord himself take vengeance. Nay, but we did it from fear, 
that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have we to do, or rather, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan a boundary between us and you. You Reubenites and Gadites, you have no portion in the Lord. So your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offerings or sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you and between the generations after us that we do perform the service to the Lord in His presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings, lest your children say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought, if this should be said to us or to our descendants in time to come, we should say, Behold the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings or sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for burnt offerings, cereal or sacrifice other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before His tabernacle. When Phinehas the priest and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the Reubenites and the Gadites and the Manassehites spoke, it pleased them well. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, said to the Reubenites and Gadites and the Manassehites, Today we know that the Lord is in the midst of us, because you have not committed this treachery against the Lord. Now you have saved the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. Then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, and the chiefs returned from the Reubenites and the Gadites in the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan, to the people of Israel, and brought back word to them. And the report pleased the people of Israel. And the people of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the Reubenites and Gadites were settled. The Reubenites and the Gadites called the altar witness because, they said, it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Amen. And may God add understanding and blessing to this reading of His Holy Word. More obvious chapters of the book. I mean by that that if you are to find its truths and its lessons and apply them, you've got to be diligent. You've got to use your mind as well as your soul to dig out the truth. There are four interwoven themes uh, within this one incident. The first is the obvious one, the last occasion on which the question of the two and a half tribes east of the Jordan is dealt with. The key to that whole incident, of course, is found in another book of the Bible, in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 32. But there are four themes. That's the first of them. The second, which almost disappears, is the fact that here the army of Israel is demobilized. We will not look at that because it's just something that happens. The third of these interwoven themes is the building of the altar at the side of the Jordan, the memorial altar, which the two and a half tribes call a copy. And the fourth theme, of course, is the appearance again of this new priest, the son of Eleazar, Phinehas. So we'll look at the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh as one theme, The altar is a second, and then Phinehas is our third and last. The chapter begins, as you saw, in most translations the same, with the word then, which links chapter 22 with the end of chapter 21. That sounds so very obvious, doesn't it? But it links it in meaning and sense. In other words, here in chapter 22 is something which happened to affirm the total faithfulness of God to affirm the complete trustworthiness of the Lord. God promises and fulfills His promise. And thanksgiving should be made for that. God is faithful despite His people. 
He is faithful to them, even although they disobeyed in the wilderness, even although they grumbled against Him and against His chosen leaders and provoked God in flat disobedience, even when they came into the land, still disobeying God in the next generation. Think of what happened at Ai with the sin of Achan. And yet, this chapter affirms God remains true to Himself and faithful to His people. God promised them this land away back four centuries and more before Genesis chapter 12. He promised that in this land and through possessing this land, the seed of Abraham would multiply Genesis 13. He promised that although Abraham would not enter the land within four generations, his children would. Genesis 15. He promised that when they did, he would preserve them and keep them. Genesis 28. That he would deliver them from the kings of the land. That he would give the kings and authorities in Canaan into their hands. Deuteronomy 7. And that then he would give them rest within the land of promise. Deuteronomy 12. And this chapter says, God is faithful to his promise. He is that kind of God. True to himself and true to his people. Now, of course, there remained sin in the lives of the people. There remained disobedience within their possession of the land. They failed to take the land, which was itself a failure of faith, a failure to obey, like the remnant of sin in the Christian heart that we read of in Romans chapter 7, even following Romans chapters 5 and 6 and the great affirmations of our freedom. We are still in a limited sense, in the sense that we have a remnant within us captive to sin. Failure to possess the land, failure to possess what God promised and held out to them was a failure of faith. And yet we still need to see the history of God's dealings with this people. We need to know and believe that God is faithful and that God's promises despite His people, not because of them, But God's promises will be fulfilled, perfectly kept, because He is a perfectly faithful Lord. That's what the chapter is saying. We are to rely upon the promises of God by faith. That's why the New Testament tells us that the promises of God find their yes in Him, that is, in Christ Jesus. It's a lesson easily missed that the chapter and all that it records is calling us to stand by faith upon the promises of God. I'll put it more simply still. To believe God's Word as the way in which we believe God. Now, the events of this chapter really only make sense If you understand what's gone before in the chapter in Numbers, we mentioned Numbers 32. If you carry a marker in your Bible, could I suggest that for this morning you stick it in Numbers 32? Let me just read the first five verses and make a few quick references to others. Numbers 32, the sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, had a very great multitude of cattle, and they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, the place was a place for cattle. And so the people of Gad and the sons of Reuben came to, the, to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, to the leaders of the congregation, and they asked Look at verse 5. If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. Now that's where this whole question arises. It arises here where the people seven years before had said, please don't take us in. Let us have our possession on this side of the River Jordan. Now if you've still got the chapter, Numbers 32 open, Look at verse 6, where you see that Moses at first, like Israel in our chapter this morning, was suspicious of this, very suspicious. Moses thought that this was cowardice or laziness or something worse. And he, Moses, recalled and recalled to them the faint-heartedness of their fathers. Look at verses 8 and 9 of the chapter. He tells them that he fears that their disobedience will bring the wrath of God upon all the people. That's in verse 14 and around there. 
Now, these accusations, and they are accusations, these accusations are answered by the two and a half tribes from verse 16 of that chapter onwards when they say, not only will we come with you, but we are willing to lead as the Lord commands. And they did. Now, Joshua firmly then reminded the tribes of this when they first came into the land of Canaan. If you can think all the way back to Joshua chapter 1, you'll find there verses 12 to 15, isn't it, that Joshua bluntly reminded them of their promise, and they kept it. Now, he did not take their presence amongst the army of Israel, their obedience to God for granted, He did not appeal to them on grounds of their national ties and loyalties to the other tribes. He didn't even appeal to them on grounds of their personal favor. But Joshua called them to obedience to their vow. Obedience to God. And you'll notice the response. Joshua restates to them their obligation before God. And they just as explicitly affirm their readiness to obey. And they did this, and they did it in full. Joshua chapter 4 tells us that they did. And here, seven years later, they are still amongst the people of Israel to prove that they did. There is a proper place for renewing our vows to God. There is a proper time for renewing vows of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is also a proper time and place for being reminded and called to go on. And that is one of the things God sets before us this morning in this chapter. A call to believe His promises and to be faithful to our own vows to go on with Him. Now, Joshua... Joshua generously, gladly, openly states that they have been faithful. Faithfulness, you know, is made a great deal of in the Bible. But it's not made a great deal of by us, is it? Jesus promises the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, yet to come to all who obey him. But people don't get very much appreciation or thanks in the Christian life, in this life. Seven years, it seems, they served obediently. Seven years, these two and a half tribes put obligation to God and obligation to God's people before their own affairs on the other side of the River Jordan. They put God and the nation before their own families. And they waited, and they waited for Joshua to speak to them about returning home. Now, given they don't wait as long as Caleb did, nevertheless, they wait and wait faithfully. And at the end of these seven years, their brethren have rest, says this chapter. And so it's time for them to go home. And you'll notice that Joshua's advice, his counsel to them, is not firstly about going home to land and families, but about going on with the Lord. Verse 5 of our chapter, Joshua 22, is very much a call to these two and a half tribes to go on with God. Take good care to observe the commandments and to love the Lord your God and keep all His ways. That is to continue as their first priority. And it is for us too. You see, knowing God's law is incomplete if God's people don't do it. There are many people who know what God requires but don't meet it. And here is a tribe, two and a half of them in fact, who have come not only to know the law of God, but have done it, have been faithful to their vows for these seven years, and are now called to continue in faithfulness. And the same stands for us. Knowing what is required of us is not complete until we do it. Jesus teaches that the true mark and measure of love is obedience. If you love me, Keep my commandments. 
obedience is the only indication we can give that we truly understand and accept God's call upon our lives. Now, I suppose that since these tribes appear once more here for the last time as far as we are concerned, there's something we need to say again. The question always arises, did they do right or did they do wrong in the first place in staying on the wrong side of the Jordan? Some say yes, they did. Some say no, they didn't. After initial doubts, remember, Moses blessed them. After Joshua was suspicious of them, he sent them back with blessing. After the people thought they were about to begin a civil war here in this chapter, they nevertheless accept their obedience. Now you have to set that on the one side between the fact on the other that the book of Chronicles tells us that they ended their existence east of Jordan in total disobedience to God. But my friends, so did the other tribes on the west side of the Jordan eventually going off into captivity to Babylon. The fact is that they, I think, should have crossed the Jordan. And yet God honored their decision and blessed them where they were. But the lessons are clear, aren't they? Obedience to God comes first. And the spiritual, verse 5, comes before the material, the dividing of the spoil, verse 8. And that's set down clearly enough. But then comes conflict. Then comes misunderstanding. And this misunderstanding is focused upon the building of this memorial altar. Commended and blessed, these two and a half tribes now act foolishly. I wouldn't put it any stronger than that, but they're being imprudent and unwise, and they come near to wrecking everything. Now there's a word to those who stand seeking obedience before God, that we have to be careful not to become complacent. Isn't it Paul who says to the Corinthians, let him who thinks he stands take care lest he fall? These two tribes commended now nearly blow the whole thing. They seem to bring unnecessary trouble upon themselves just as we can. We can bring all sorts of difficulties into our own lives through misunderstanding and through a lack of wisdom in our Christian living. Everything seems to be going right. And then they decide to build this altar on the west side of the Jordan and immediately they're in trouble. Remember there was already a memorial at the Jordan, chapter 4, do you remember? One in the middle of the river to mark the crossing, one at the west side of the river to mark their coming into the land. But these two and a half tribes want a memorial of their return to the east. And they say it's to remind their children lest they should be forgotten. But this is an altar, and that's the problem. An altar is a very different thing from a cairn. And this is not something to do at God's command. You can search as hard as you like. The Bible nowhere says that God instructed them to build this thing. And you'll notice that it says no less than three times that this was a large and impressive thing which they built for themselves, it says. It was a big altar. It was their altar. It was not by God's command. And it was, above all, it was an altar, not a memorial. Now let's not use the word disobedience, but certainly we can say that here these two and a half tribes go beyond the will of God, and they lay themselves open to misunderstanding, and they nearly bring civil war upon the people before they've even settled in Canaan. Seven years and they nearly cause civil war. Now their motive may have been all right. We don't want to be forgotten. We don't want our children to be forgotten by your children. Their motives may have been all right, but their method was totally wrong. You know, things that we do off our own bat without seeking God's guidance can be well motivated, but can lead in the end to trouble. And many good things become bad things in our lives. Think of the brazen serpent in Numbers 21, which was set up amongst the people and healed them when they looked to it of the bites of the snakes, used in John chapter 3 as a picture of Jesus Christ upon the cross. 
And yet if you turn to 2 Kings chapter 18, you'll find that that thing, that brazen serpent, became an idol and a snare and a trap to the people. They called it Nehushtan. And King Hezekiah had to get rid of it as one of his first acts of cleansing the land. Right things can become wrong things. Altars can be wrong when we build them for ourselves and have not sought God's will. Right institutions in the church can become wrong. They can become dead. But you know, one of the hardest things for the church to do is to bury things that are dead. I had a a meeting that had a good beginning and had been used by God through many years in my last parish. But it became a snare. It became an alternative. It became a place for people to go who weren't willing to commit themselves to the thrust of the ministry, to the work of prayer. And it became a meeting where they could go and hide from Jesus Christ, not find Him. And that's happened to many organizations within the church. That rather than be places where people meet to honor Christ, they are places where they meet to hide from Him and to hide away from real commitment to what God is doing. Nehushtan. You can build altars that should never be built. Now, you'll notice that the man who is sent to deal with this is Phineas. A man who at one stage, do you remember, took a javelin to a sinner and impaled him in zeal for the Lord. But here, hasty action would be wrong. And yet it's the very man who took hasty action in obedience to God who now holds back hasty action to prevent disobedience. His credibility lies in the fact that he was clearly not a man afraid to act for God. And when he said, it is not the time to be acting in haste, people believed him. And wisdom prevailed. We are told, aren't we, to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger because the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Or here is Phineas, who could have been considered a hothead, shown here to be a very careful, a wise and obedient servant of God. He doesn't fail to investigate. He doesn't go off half cock. He waits until he knows the situation. It's like Paul writing to the Christians at Corinth and saying, you know, you're taking each other to the law courts and brothers, you're not dealing with each other as a matter of wisdom. It's amazing that the very man whom Numbers chapter 25 tells us could act with such decision, such zeal for God that it took the breath away of the whole nation, the only one who came forward and punished the sinner. Do you remember? now says, listen to them. Listen and be patient. And he talks frankly to them and he exposes the possibility of disobedience and what it will mean. He points out that they could seem to be building a rival altar. And he points out what Achan did. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, he seems to be saying to them. But he listens to them and he speaks to them not only in truth but with grace. My friends, truth without grace is very severe. And grace without truth can be sentimental, of course. Truth without love, love without truth. Neither of these things are Christ's way. And the response he gets through his patience and wisdom is one of a sincere apology from the two and a half tribes. Their intention, they say, was not to disobey. Their motive was fear that they would be forgotten, but they should never have acted out of fear. Fear and guilt are poor motives and a dangerous ground for action. And Phineas responds with gladness and accepts their innocence and brings the message back to the people. And civil war is avoided. Oh, that God would give us grace in the church of His dear Son to show the same wisdom. 
to inquire with truth and yet with grace and to take a firm stance when it's needed, but always in obedience to God's word and with mercy. Let me just say a few words about Phineas before we close our worship this morning then. He was the right man for this terrible situation, this dangerous moment in the history of the people of God where they could have pulled their nationhood apart in civil war. He was the right man. Why was he the right man? Above all, because his life made his leadership acceptable. It was the very fact that this was the man who showed such zeal for God that made his will that the people should be patient and wait on God credible. I don't know what you've made of this circus that's been going on in the United States and on our televisions for so long. I mean the O.J. Simpson trial. But it seems very clear to me that it was the contradictions and the lies in the police testimony that made the, guilt, the verdict of not guilty possible. It was the fact that the witnesses had no credibility that undermined the prosecution case. Well, here is a man whose credibility is found in his life so that his leadership is accepted and heeded. And in that, he points to Jesus Christ, who is the only one with complete credibility. Numbers chapter 25 says that he was a man who walked with God in peace and equity. Yes, he was. He learned obedience. He learned it painfully, but he learned it. I say he learned it painfully because, remember, it was the occasion of the sin of his two uncles, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10. It was that occasion that taught him wisdom. And this lesson made him a champion of holiness. This is the man with the javelin in Numbers 25 whose spiritual zeal was good and understood to be in no sense carnal. It was never condemned the way Peter's zeal with a sword and chopping off a servant's ear was condemned by the Lord. There's a difference between carnal zeal and godly zeal. No, this man's life makes his leadership credible. And while there are decline, while there is decline in families, as a, it's testified to in the Scriptures, we see it today in many families, don't we? There's a decline. Think of Eli and his wicked sons, and then sadly Samuel and his sons. But as well as bearing testimony to decline, the Bible bears witness to an increase and a deepening of holiness in families. Think of Eleazar and now Phineas. A man who influenced the people for nothing but good. Now, my friends, there are warnings in this chapter, of course, to be careful about our motives. There are questions we must ask ourselves about proceeding ever from fear or guilt. Never good motives. Faith it is, not fear, but faith that must be expressed in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Obedience is the proper way to express our faith. And there's a warning there. There's a warning about misunderstanding. There's a warning about not listening to others and being careful. There's a warning there about causing wars rather than bringing peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, said Jesus. Not those who cause conflict and division. Yes, there's a warning there. There's a warning to be on our guard also against the creeping progress of worldliness. Think of the deterioration of the two and a half tribes over time. A warning about growing cool to the Lord Jesus Christ. And a call always to be alive to Him. But above all, I want to leave you with this thought. That as with all the heroes of faith in the Old Testament and the New, it is Jesus Christ who is seen in the life and the person of Phinehas the priest. His truthfulness and His grace, the way He approaches these would-be rebels or apparent rebels, indicate the grace and the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ that it was the man who took a javelin to a sinner 
who showed most patience with rebels. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the one above all who has taken a javelin to sin. Dying himself and meeting sin upon the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the one who took a javelin to sin and shows infinite patience with rebels. How good and gracious our God is to reveal himself in such holiness and in such love. It is once more the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that is visible in the life of the man Phineas, the man with the javelin and the man who held back civil war. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who died to sin to make peace with God. Think on this.